Hello ladies and gentlemen, it is Patrick here, Eggnot Poker, new video today and today we're going to be going through our review analysis of the first 10,000 or so hands of my, I suppose it's a mix between a challenge and a series really, I would say it's probably more of a series than a specific challenge on the bankroll. So basically for anyone who's new to this or is not sure what this is or what's going on, basically um, um, my background is a 50 and 100 nail reg, mostly on stars. I've done a bit on GG and I'm at a few other places at the moment. But for the uh, content I've been providing recently, I have done a lot of micro stakes um, exploitation stuff. So I've been throwing out loads of different types of coaching points and different types of strategies you can use and um, with a lot of deviation to sort of fundamental GTO strategies uh, that work fantastically at the micro and the low stakes and some of the mid stakes depending on where you're playing and who you're playing against but um i thought just to make sure you didn't think i was some complete donut just spouting a load of random shite i thought well fuck it i'll do my own series uh on the micro stakes so we started off at 50 dollars um where are we currently so we're currently up uh, oh you can see my cursor so we're currently up 32 dollars and 92 cents um, our win rate is about 15. Uh, I mean, considering there are some adjusted win rates, it's between it's between 15 and a half and 16 and a half, somewhere around there at the moment. We're sort of creeping back up to where we were. Again, this we're about 10,000, 10,000 and a half hands. It's not a particularly massive sample at the moment, you know, so it's hard to determine what our sort of technical sort of real win rate would be, whether it's a little bit higher than this or potentially lower. Um, I'm hoping we can get it back up actually to around sort of 18 to 20, that's my target. I don't actually know if that kind of win rate is attainable at 2 0, um, but we'll find out, I suppose. Um, see if we can make it happen or um, or if we get destroyed, we will find out. What I'm gonna do in this video though, just as a bit of a pre -disclaim uh, disclaimer to everybody, is we're not gonna be doing any content, but I want to go over just some of the basic and general uh, generalizations and statistics from the results that we have. Um, I'm using Poker Tracker 4 for reference. Um, going through my results, going through some of the statistics, um, looking at a bunch of the hand histories. There's not massively interest. There's there's a few ones in there that I've got ten uh, top ten hands I've got here, but there's not really any that really stand out. Unfortunately, it's just I picked the the best ten I could potentially find out of the ten K hands or so that I played. So this video really, apart from me just talking and talking and talking. Really, the purpose of this video is to have a bit of a look at what we've been doing and see, see if it is working and if there's potential areas for improvement or if the um, areas of um, our game plan that are working, we're going to see if we can improve them even further. So let's have a look. So if anyone, any of you are new to, um, not necessarily new to poker, but new to like sort of tracking and analyzing results, when you're playing poker, especially online, I suppose, online or offline, it doesn't matter, but especially online when you're um, thinking about tracking your results, like getting like something like Holder Manager or Poker Tracker, um, where you can um, put your HUDs on and you can get your information on how you're playing and how your opponents are playing and so on. But it's also really, really good for just analyzing how you're playing and how your results are looking like. So for example, you can see here, like I played 10, 10 and a half thousand hands or so, not a huge sample, but you know, a decent chunk of change for um, a bit of a pit stop at, to begin with. We can see that we're pretty steadily climbing. Um, we had one very, very nasty decline, um, as you can see see um sorry if i uh take this off as you can see here with the curse so we were doing very very well here with the first sort of three or four thousand hands and then had a massive massive downswing we went about i think we went about 10 to 11 buy-in downswing within effectively like less than a thousand hands that's pretty sick actually in terms of um potentially problematic downswing but some of those hand histories they were just running kings into aces and set over set and one or two bluffs or three, two or three bluffs or so that didn't work in a couple of big scenarios, etc. It's all variance, isn't it, one way or another. But but as you can see with the green line, we are just, um, it was kind of dipping and up and down. And then we're just sort of finding our feet a bit and starting to potentially climb back up here in a nice bit of a, an ascent and an upswing back to where we should be with a bit of run good, play good combined. Um, our yellow marker here so well sorry the green line just to, to say first is our result so this is technically the in terms of all these colors and lines and jargon the green line is where where you would expect to be in terms of this is how much money you've either made or lost that's technically what it is the yellow line or goldish line here is kind of like an all-in adjustment so for example if you've had a couple of all-in scenarios you're getting it in good you're getting it in bad winning and losing it's kind of giving you a bit more of a, a somewhat 
I, I get, I, I dare say, more truthful potential win rate adjusted. So, for example, if you've been getting it in with aces against kings and you've been losing three or four times in a row, it's kind of telling you technically maybe you should have been a bit higher in your technical win rate or technical results than where you are currently. But it all... Um, it all evens out in the long run anyway. But our blue line and our red line, these are the two ones that are affecting our win rate or loss rate. So we can see where we currently are with our actual money earned, but it's this red line and blue line which are the most important because you're, basically your blue line here is determining how much of your money you're winning on showdown. So for example, whether you're calling opponents down or whether you're betting and getting called, it's kind of giving you an indication um, in terms of review for how your um, how your results are coming. So, for example, if you if you know a lot of your results at micro stakes are primarily a blue line, that's kind of what we're looking for, really, because at micro stakes you're kind of looking to do a lot of value betting and a lot of folding. Um, you, you will be doing bluffing and you will be winning pots on on showdown, but you should technically be folding without uh, and not going to showdown versus a lot of opponents so it's tough to attain a really really tough uh, sorry a really really large red line um, potentially depending on how you're swinging but primarily we're looking at having a really nice steady consistent blue line if we can get a positive red line even better but primarily blue line and then obviously this red line on the opposite the blue is the non-showdown winnings again it, it will fluctuate up and down but from what i can see here i think we've been doing pretty well I think just from the first 10k hands as a bit of a summary, I would say that um, in terms of showdown, this may be a bit biased and subjective towards stars, but at 2 and L, it feels like a massive, massive error to be going down, to be getting to showdown without what should really be um, absolute top of range in most cases, depending on how the hands play out. But the populations, I, I must have said this a million times over the last 20, 30, 40 videos, but... The, the, you must be very, very careful with how how wide you're getting to showdown in terms of calling villains down. Basically, I've just been looking to just get away. I've been folding, uh, I've been opening quite a wide range of hands because I feel like I can make profit um, post flop against villains. I've been soft playing a lot of hands. I haven't been three betting as much as I would normally if I was playing some um, bigger stakes. But playing at micro stakes, I actually like doing more calling, which means I'm getting to getting to getting to see more flops, getting to see more turns and rivers and so on, and potentially um, bin opponents that way, rather than sort of bulldozing them pre where they tend to overfold. But we'll go through that potentially uh, at another date. But results wise, I'm very happy with this. Um, We'll look at some of the hand histories and we'll move into the actual statistics next. So if I move over on my PT4 here and I start clicking on statistics, I can actually start seeing, I've got my graph again, but it's just as a reference. I can actually start looking at what types of um, statistics I'm using and playing. So I'm not going to sit here and spend ages going through each individual um, statistic because it's not it's not needed. It's not necessary. We're just going to go through some of the main ones. So um, as you can see, adjusted win rate, uh, it's only slightly bigger. I think we're like, yeah, there you go. 1573, big blind 100, adjusted all in 1617. It's very, it's quite close at the moment. We had a couple of uh, massive all in sp um, spots where we got it in bad, unfortunately. I think we had like Kings v Aces a couple of times and things like that. So, you know, it, it, it all fluctuates up and down as. Uh, as the hands would go on, but it'll even out in time. So we're playing quite a high VPIP. You don't, ha I think there's two ways to do this. I think technically the, the, the best and most optimal way to play these micro stakes is to play more hands, as many hands as you can get away with playing because people are not three betting and attacking you enough and you are just able to destroy people post flop. I'm not saying open any two cards, but I mean, I've got like a 24% VPIP here. I would even potentially go bigger than this and just literally look to play as many hands. Because I'm not being funny or nasty or entitled, but technically I'm playing in a pool of players who aren't, you know, this is going to sound really entitled, but I'm just saying I should expect to be able to crush 2 and L really, if I can beat higher stakes, well, higher stakes, not high stakes, just a disclaimer. But if I can beat stakes higher than this, I should never really technically be able to beat these lower stakes at quite a high win rate. I would try to get in as many situations as I can with these perceived weaker players so again it, it, in terms of being an optimal player i know that you don't want to play tons and tons and tons of hands technically because of like the rake for example or um the fact that you know it's these people tend to 
do lots of volatile things. You could just wait for good hands and just value bet and get caught by worse and not make too many mistakes. But the thing is, villains just tend to always do it in. You can just play lots of hands, get in lots of situations and just make more money inevitably than you should do in a lot of situations. I don't want to sit here and, and just sort of blabble on, but generally speaking, I'm trying to get in lots of situations. The only thing that I deviated from quite quite a lot is the PFR use I mean I'm actually surprised this is closer to 20 I thought this would be lower actually I have I promise you I haven't looked at this in terms of statistics until today I thought this would probably be around 17 or so because my PFR like I I tend to call quite more uh, quite more often than I would normally for example like if you like very very tight opponents are opening under the gun I tend to flat more with hands like ace king or like ace queen suited or um, pocket queens and things like some of the time I tend to flat ace king more in position and things like that more than I would normally three um than I would potentially uh, I would usually three bet them more than I do because I feel like it's making more money in the long run against some of the very very tighter opponents one way or another at these stakes so I'm actually surprised that was still 20. I must be raised. I must be still more aggressive than I actually thought I was, but I'm happy with that. I think that's okay. I think if this was this was lower than 17, it would start to become too um, a bit too passive. So this is good. I'm happy with this. And again, because we're not three betting as much, this three bet will start to suffer. I know we are three betting quite polar and quite aggressively in a lot of situations, and I'm forcing that more than a normal frequency might suggest at, at GTO, but. Uh, things like king do suited, queen do suited, etc. Jack nine off in big blind, things like that. For people who are wondering what the hell I just said, to supplement this um, this three bet. But generally, uh, as a bit of a my exploit is, I tend to three bet the very very nutted end, absolute nutted end, and the absolute worst um, types of um, blocker combos um, that I can, rather than three betting most of the middling um, types of hands. In, in terms of the challenge, like, I'm not being funny, like, I know thousands of people in, in the long run are going to watch these videos and they're going to start to understand how I play. This isn't, this is just me playing and showing you content. And it's also showing you what types of exploits you can use. So I'm really not fussed um, by people knowing specifically how I play in, in a lot of scenarios. You don't need to be super balanced or, you know, or super worried anyway. And it really doesn't matter. Usually my three bet would be around, BB uh, would be around 10 to 12%, genuinely. Probably closer to around 11, actually, if I was being honest. The reason this is lower is because of the reason I just said. I am just tend to be more flop-orientated, turn-orientated, post-flop-orientated than pre-flop. And that tends to net me so much more money winning bigger pots with an under-represented uh, rep range. So a lot of these people are waiting for good hands or they're bluffing. One or the other, very, very polarised villains are tend to be. Um, but the knit opens ace-queen... He doesn't get three bets, it's an ace I board. It's much easier to check raise and stack off with ace king or just call down and jam river and stack off with ace king with an under rep range when, for example, straight and flush draws miss, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas you three bet and they tend to fold a lot of like those ace queen offsuits. And if they call with like ace queen suited or ace queen, they're already automatically on the defensive. This just, is just an example uh, is what I'm saying. But my, my three bet and PFR are slightly lower than what they might be if I was playing a different stake for that reason. But it's making, uh, I, I think it's actually making a tremendous difference. When you start playing, excuse me, when you start playing like sort of more like 10 and L to 25, I would say at least 25 plus 10 and L's, I guess probably hit and miss, but you'd probably be looking to deviate less with those calls and have more just sort of standard generalized three bets. But another day, another day. Um, the one massive thing that I, I'm actually shocked at looking at this is this one. So, I mean, I'm not shocked, but I'm surprised it's this high, is the fold to three bet. So my fold to three bet here is about 80%. So you you, you really should be looking somewhere between sort of 60-ish, give or take, maybe up or down a couple of percent, depending on the populations and the sites that you're playing on in terms of fold to three bet. Also, it depends on the positions as well. But generally 80% is extremely high and somewhat problematic in terms of like a technical number like 80% basically means well Christ eight times out of ten if you three bet me with any two cards I'm just going to fold it's it is quite exploitable however I'm not telling you to fold 80% of the time it's not a thing but this is only a 10k sample as well but I've been in a lot of situations because I open wider like under the gun MP etc I do get in more situations where I have the opportunity to be three bet. So that is something I suppose that that is causing this on top of the fact that I am over or however you want to say it technically over folding to three bets. So a lot of my villains over relatively decent samples are playing 
like five to ten percent less hands. They're raising five to ten percent less hands. They're three betting like four to seven or four to eight percent less hands and so on than they should be, which means that their ranges are so constricted towards like nut end value as an assumption. I think that it's actually technically better just to get away from a lot of the marginal calls honestly. And I don't like having the four bet bluffs versus the nits. I prefer having it versus the over, over aggressive, over aggressive um, sort of maniacs, not the nits because the nits don't tend to three bet fold because their three bet range is fucking strong in the first place. This is something I will be keeping an eye on because it is extremely high. But again, I think the deviations I've chosen are working. At least I, I don't just mean from the results being results orientated, but I do genuinely think they are. It is better to be airing on the side of caution in terms of the uh, the fold to three bet. I'm not going to go through everything else. I mean, they're all relative. If you, if you want to screenshot these, look at these and sort of dissect and ask questions. As you, I'm just going to scroll it across and you can see slowly. The only other things is um, like my C-bet overall is, I mean, I actually thought it'd be higher than 60%, but I thought it was closer to around 70, but it's okay, I suppose. I'm C-betting more often than I would be. And um, I'm try I'm choosing not to like check call slash check raise a lot of candidates that would normally do so or check fold. I tend to see bet most of my range in a lot of scenarios, both um, in C-bet pot uh, bet pots, normal uh, single raise pots and three bet pots, for example. I tend to just see bet very often because you're just putting yourself in situations where you just keep this sort of battle axe in your hands and you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And as long as you're not completely doing it in like people don't raise you and people don't call you kind of correctly so you're better off to sort of betting for value or doing a lot of bluffing and then potentially pot controlling in between because you're just not being exploited people aren't sort of looking at how often you're c betting and they're not raising enough and you're just sort of pushing forward and it's it, it works it, it does really 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 work quite well as you'll uh, potentially see in some of these um hand histories i'll do in a second so yeah overall i'm um I'm pretty happy with this. I think um, in terms of like positional profit, again, it's like getting involved with as many hands as possible is really, 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 really good um, within reason. Just because people are folding to steals, people are folding to re-steals, you know, like it's kind of like a game of like um, chicken really where people kind of just want to take it down. Like they kind of want to just bluff you or wait for a really good hand to value bet against you. And there's kind of not much in between. It's very quite, it's very, very polarized I tend to find. But um, yeah, we've been making very, very decent money on the button and the cutoff. Um, potentially, lose. I mean, you're always going to be basically a loser in the blinds. But it's just about reducing the amount that you hemorrhage over time because you know you are never to be losing in the big blind um, in the blinds, for example, because you're forced to play every time you you go around on rotation. But I think I would have liked to have lost slightly less in the big blind. I mean, I know my adjustment here says I've lost 881 rather than 1214. So actually looking at the adjustment, I'm relatively happy with that. So I think that's that's okay, to be honest. Um, and we had a look at the graph already, didn't we? So that's in there. So yeah, um, I think it was pretty good in terms of like sessions and so on. I mean, we uh, my sessions are a bit biased because I've only been doing these for the YouTube videos apart from one sort of mega session that I did. That's why these sessions only usually have like 80 hands, 100 hands or whatever or whatnot in them. Um, so yeah, it's uh, there you go. There's the session here with the 5,700 hands. That was quite a funny one. Um, sorry, I'm throwing around all over the place. That was quite a funny one in terms of the hands won and lost. But that was the biggest session I put in. I think we were literally down maybe 12 buy-ins at one point, And then we managed to finally grind that back and get result and get a small sort of 50, 60 big blind um, profit at the end of it. So that was pretty cool. I'll, uh, I'll take that. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to have a look at um, some of these hand histories. So I do have a document here as well somewhere. Um, this one where this document here is basically just saying um, some of the coaching points, which I, I have, I'm going to mention these only briefly because I put these in videos before, is, um, can I zoom in on this? So there you go, so that's a little bit easier for you to read. Um, the basic process that I'm using at the micro stakes, and again, I would just urge you to look at some of the previous content. I'll put some links in the description below so you can see them in more detail. But the processes that I'm basically looking at is I want to specifically have a look at each player and mark them as which player, player, player profile they are. So are they a recreational, tight recreational, an aggressive reg, whatever. Mark them appropriately and then choose the appropriate expo exploitative uh, play style against them. I'm literally trying to play every single hand in a vacuum. 
that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not looking to do some massive strategic employment, uh, deployment where I'm balancing every single scenario because at 2 and L, I just don't need to be. Same with 5 and 10 and to 25 to some extent. You just don't need to be super exp uh, super um, balanced in most situations that you find yourself in because the people you're against, you just, you, you have to respect people, but at the same time, it's just, they're very, you know, the games are going to be more about what's in front of you than what the, the big picture is, honestly, in terms of results. So again, just a couple of the main coaching points. I'm not going to go through and explain them because we're just talking about results and hand histories today as a review, not um, how to actually play the game. So I'm sea betting and barreling often. I'm also trying to play as many hands as I can physically get away with opening, as well as three betting and playing post flop. And I'm also, um, excuse me, just trying to get in as many situations as I can put myself in. Because I honestly feel like I can win um, a lot of pots. The only deviation with that is um, folding to three bets but, um, against tight to opponents. If, uh, especially out of position. Potentially in position we call it a little bit wider. But generally I'm trying to stay away from villains perceived top end of range. Uh, when I'm looking at battling them. So mainly like single raise pots. Um, very polar regression pre. So we're doing a lot of um, three betting. and um, Mostly three betting. Not so much four betting at this stake. With a lot of hands like aces and kings and queens. Ace king suited. Ace queen suited. And then hands like queen deuce suited. Jack loan off. Button versus being blind etc. We're very very polarized. Top end and low end um, of range. We're attacking a lot of ca um, captain obvious weakness with um, with large sizes ourselves. So against most um, weaker opponents who we know are, are checking with capped ranges or they're checking um, unbalanced in an unbalanced way, um, like they're 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 sea betting say twenty or thirty percent of the time. So when they do bet, they're generally quite strong most of the time. And then the other way around, if they're sea betting sort of seventy eighty percent of the time, they, we, we can attack them quite a lot. And then when they're checking again, we can sort of be aggressive against them. Your populations at like two and L five and L ten and L etc. They just don't have a lot of protected checks, as in they're, they're checking because they don't want to face a lot of aggression, rather than checking either for deception or pot control most of the time. So abuse it is basically what we're saying. Obviously, betting heavy for value versus fish. And then against the sort of tighter and nittier players, we're looking to avoid more marginal heavier cooldowns. So, for example, if we've got like these sort of marginal sort of third or fourth nut top pairs and we're facing two to three barrels from a tight villain who wins on showdown most of the time and doesn't really bluff, then again, look, we're potentially looking to just sort of overfold most of the time. Pre-flop, we're looking to do a lot of soft playing. So again, we're hands like the nutted end, like ace king suited aces with obviously three betting, etc. But hands like ace jack suited, king queen suited, you know, like jacks and queens to some extent, depending on the sit on the positions. Ace king off, like we, we against tighter opponents, not not so much better opponents, aggressive opponents, or um, like fish, for example, but just very tight nitty opponents and extreme end tags. You're better off playing quite soft in position with those sort of like mid to heavy range that isn't quite nutted, like top sort of between sort of one and three percent or so, three and a half percent, like aces and kings, etc. Um you you tend to make more money long term by being quite soft rather than sort of being super aggressive against them, honestly. You want to try and um what's the word I'm trying to say? You want to try and under rep a lot of hands. Uh, in order to win that's I, i've gone into strategies on in other videos so I'll, I'll see if i can find some links to those and pop them in the description before you start asking questions go oh, all the information will be in those previous video links um not for today um and then finally the last two just again just generally being aggressive versus high percentage um three betters find more aggressive bluffs and semi bluffs and barrels we're going to be doing lots of um check raising on flops and turns we're going to be doing loads of semi bluffing loads of bad um sea betting and barreling generally really really aggressive and then finally just prioritizing folding and overfolding, um sorry prioritizing folding or raising versus nits rather than sort of really heavy um cooldowns unless it's quite an obvious spot to do so so those out of the way excellent perfect let's get rid of those so i want to have a look at some of the top hands that we did so in order to do this this is really awkward with obs unless i'm just not very good at sort of doing this um so what I need to do is I need to go on to, I need to keep flicking screens, which is quite tilting, but um, it is what it is, I guess, and we'll go with it. So um, some of the top hands, I'm just going to go through very, very quickly over the next sort of 15, 20 minutes tops, and then we'll be done with this video. So what I'm going to do here is, um, I mean, okay, it's got some of the people's names. I guess, I guess maybe it would have been better to have um, blotted some of these out, but I, so I apologize if, um, if I if any of you see yourselves in here, um, for better or for worse. Um, just as a disclaimer, these aren't all winning hands. These aren't all well-played hands. Some of these are 
poorly played. Some of them are well played. Some of them are winning hands and some of them are losing hands. Um, so it's not just me sitting here going, oh, look at me. I've, I'm winning all my hands. So some of the interesting ones. So we get a button open from um, Mr. Hell Native and we defend, uh, decide to call in the Jack-9. Uh, I do have some of the notes on this hand, but most of these are basically off the fly, so do bear with me. So we defended the jack nine off, um, skipping through, seeing how the action goes. Facing bet, we do decide to call. It's pretty standard, pretty easy. I don't really want to check race too often. I guess you'd be looking more at three betting hands, like maybe like ace nine, king nine, queen nine. I think jack nine off with no backdoor flush draw. I, I think I'd just be calling. Turn three, a little bit better for me overall. Could potentially lead. I think we do decide to check we do. Face big bet from, from Villain. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. I think we're going to call and see a river nice and easy. This is the part of the hand that I wanted to look at. So I'm not saying this was played well or played badly. I have my exploitative deviations. So I'm going to ex do a pretty heavy exploit here. And I'm going to tell you why I've done what I've done. So what happens here is we do um, have an easy check on the river. Villain's got some ace of clubs. Villain's got some ace bluffs like, you know, like ace 10, ace 8. Oh, it depends, depends on the villain type really, doesn't it? It shouldn't have a massive amount of ace X. We should really be okay here most of the time. Or maybe we're losing to like, you know, uh, I would assume tens through kings and then some potential ace X that may have double barreled and some like nut club draws, etc. So the thing is, so what happens here is villain goes ahead and bets a really small size. So just over like sort of 14%, 15%, whatnot, whatever it is, 12, 13% or something. So really like this is in hindsight, right? Like with this price, it, technically, okay, this is a really easy call. Like there is nothing else to say. This is a very easy call. However, um, based on the HUD information I had, and I did have a note on this guy, is that this guy tends to um, not bluff rivers. And not, and at least from what I've seen from his information, he doesn't look like the kind of guy that um, value bets very, very thin. So for example, this guy, I determined if he was going to bluff a flush draw versus this specific villain, he would bet bigger than this, in my opinion, right? Or not bluff at all. Like he would just give up here with like King 10 of clubs, for example, or like Jack, nine, uh, Jack 8 of clubs or whatever, right? So he would just be giving up on those. I, I don't know if he really gets here with an ace, but what I'm saying is it's likely that he gets here with something like kings or queens or jacks or tens or like ace nine or potentially like ace x of clubs that wants to, you know, bet the river thinking it's ahead but doesn't want to go really, really big. So uh, this is a massive exploit and I would probably still just call here because the price is so good that it's just, we're just going to chop with all nine x. Maybe sometimes he just finds the bluff for the sake of it. But in the moment, I genuinely felt like this guy didn't, like, w had a better hand than me. And um, he's got, like, tens through kings, or even more likely, potentially, an ace. So I, basically, what I decided was to raise this. Now, I'm not saying this raise is a good, good raise. And technically, I wish I'd gone slightly smaller than this. Because if I'm trying to fold out, like, a lot of hands, maybe, like, tens through kings, which would likely bet here, then I don't need to go, like, 3x pot, or 3 and a bit, like, sort of 3 and a three and a third x pot i could just go like 45 and fold that range if i feel like this guy's got a lot of asex and just goes small like he just wants to get like guarantee the call then again i don't think i need to go this big because i'm i mean the thing is like there's one combo of threes only one combo of pocket nines this guy doesn't have sevens the way he played right like the guy could have aces as well but it's like I don't really feel like if he had aces, sevens, nines, a three, ace, king, ace, queen, ace, jack, ace, ten, you know, like, I feel like this guy has mostly got, like, these sort of tens through kings range, personally. So I would have, I like my raise, but I would have preferred something a bit smaller than this. So, but the reason I'm showing you this is that was my thought process. I thought this was quite an interesting hand. Like, unfortunately, just to show you, boom, we do sort of just run into it and get punished. That's why technically you should just call, like, that's the best option would have been to have just called and moved on to the next hand. Having the exploitative check raise for the reasons I said, like I generally feel like we don't win this. I don't think we even chop. I think he would check back a nine. I think he's got tens through kings and very, very low amount of the time he's got an ace. I don't think we win. I need to raise. So I do like the raise, but I wish I'd gone slightly smaller here. I wish I'd gone like sort of 60 cents or something rather than sort of jamming because you, I am kind of forcing him um into a scenario where it's like i'm putting i'm kind of over over attacking and there's not a huge amount of value that i would have that played this way there's only one combo of like threes you know like i suppose i could jam like maybe ace nine for value potentially um 
maybe I've got sevens, nines, threes, like ace three, three X has played. But again, it's like, it's probably a bit of an overplay uh, in terms of size. So that was that one. Um, a bit funky. I, I like, I, I don't mind the raise. I'm not saying I love it. I, I kind of wish I'd raised um, a little bit smaller than that, but you know, it, it is what it is. Um, so the next one is ace 10. Let me just bring this up. Sorry, one second thick with these it's really irritating so with ace 10 then we had a let's flick through this so we had a cutoff open we threw bet in the small blind cutoff defends so we're gonna have more hands like queens and jacks theoretically speaking we're gonna have more hands like queens jacks we're gonna have some um more combos of hands like ace queen we're gonna have more combos of like queen jack off we've got aces we've got kings we're doing very well on this board so you know we can do a lot of things here go for a small c bet get the call so we um upgrade from a gut shot to an open ender pocket nines and king 10 are in villains range at uh, two and l i would probably expect like jack nine and queen jack uh, sorry queen nine and jack nine suited to always be in villains range probably 10 eight suited might potentially always be might potentially be in there as well so there are amount a decent amount of hands that villain technically at this pool will improve on however i do block ace queen both suited and unsuited which is a big call and most importantly i do block all of these sort of jack 10 queen 10 10 9 king 10 10 8 type hands with this 10 of spades i suppose you could also argue i block like queen 10 and jack 10 and of spades and so on um so that's also pretty good uh, so we're going to be doing a lot of turn and uh, barreling into river jamming with this combo. So I did decide to go ahead and bet just over half pot, I believe. We do get the call. Six is irrelevant, doesn't change anything. Now we're hoping for this um, pot size jam. So what do you think? Do you think it works? Yes or no? Uh, no, it doesn't, unfortunately. <laughs> we do run into top two. Technically, villain should have folded Queen Jag off. But again, like we're never expecting this to fold post flop. But I was pretty happy with this um, combo to... Um, go for a triple and jam the river with but you know against the tightest villains i still don't mind this shove technically because villains can still get here with hands like um queen 10 suited jack 10 suited 9 10 suited things like that um potentially as well so there are and we do block hands like ace queen so and obviously the straights which is the primary reason to have is the river shove so this was um quite a good one what else do we have Hopefully we can find some winning ones as well. That'd be pretty nice. Let's flick through. Queen deuce. So let's make this a little bit bigger. So we let's have a look. We got a, high, a cutoff open from Villain, Mr. Shaggy. We found a three bet with our queen deuce suited because we love a very polarized three bet in the big blind. Getting a defend. Otherwise it'd probably be a bit boring for a hand history. So we flop top pair here. Um, I'm not going to be really three betting eights and sixes, eight six suited, or queen eight, a whole bunch. I'm mainly three betting hands like um, potentially like ace queen suited, queens, aces kings, six, um, some nut broadway, things like that in terms of value. Um, I don't mind having a check or a bet here at micro stakes. I think it doesn't matter really. I don't think it's too much to say either way. So the thing with this hand is we've decided to find a check this time and villain just goes ahead and bonk, just goes all in. I've got absolutely no information whatsoever on my villain. <laughs> so the way I perceive this hand, this guy, as, as far, if I remember rightly, I think he jammed like that, like instantly. So I don't know how to generally perceive that. I, I perceived it most of the time as a flush draw. I don't know if that's um, good or bad. You tell me at home. I generally felt like this opponent would have thought about this at least for a couple of seconds if he had a hand like queen jack or king queen or ace queen or if he's got a pair of tens or jacks or something he doesn't just jam four x pot maybe he's just got a hand like ace king of spades maybe he's got ace king with a heart maybe he's got like king ten of hearts maybe he's just got some ace nine of spades and just goes you know berserk what do you think he's he's got that's the question i don't think we can really fold because i think if this guy had potted it and then shoved up like a brick turn, it becomes more of a decision against villain type. Versus instantaneous shove, I would just assume he jams like queens. He obviously doesn't have queens, kings, aces. And we block queens and so on. So he's got less ace queen and king queen also, because we do also block these. That is somewhat relevant. We unblock all of the sort of seven, nine suited, depending on the villain. Jack 10 suited, nine, 10 suited, you know, whatnot, all the flush draws, etc. So I just felt like this was a bit of a silly jam. With some kind of like draw, backdoor draw, or some kind of weird ace high. I don't know. I felt like we were doing pretty well here. Very, very bad turn. 7 9 gets there. Um, obviously, hearts get there. Uh, we were losing to King Queen anyway. I suppose like backdoor, like 
well, the King's kind of somewhat irrelevant, to be honest. But um, we do run it twice, and we lose to Ace-Queen. So, unfortunate for us. Um, villain just stuck it in. Just decided to fuck it. Just going to stick it in. Don't care. YOLO. So, unfortunately, that was that one. Uh, what else do we have? Jack, 10 of clubs. Let's have a look at this one. So what happens here? So we open the Jack 10 suited, UTG, face a cut off call, and a three bet from um, Big Blind. So I don't, ha I, I can't remember. I, I, I didn't go through all the HUD stat information through all of these hands. I'm basically just bringing up um, the most interesting ones that I sort of skipped through with some notes based on what um, some of the hand histories I had. I can't remember this villain type, honestly. Um, the squeeze size isn't particularly big. It, it's okay. It's it's okay. It's a little bit on the small side. Just the way we were playing, we're going to be in position. We've got Jack-10 suited. Um, you could fold this. There is an argument for folding. I don't mind folding. I, I think I just decided to call this time. I'm not using really an RNG for micro stakes. So just felt like calling in position and expecting to play this multi-way, so, which, which happens. Flop top pair, put ourselves in a tough spot with a relatively small 3 to 1 SBR. So we'll see how we go. I think the only information I had on this player potentially was that he was quite aggressive, but I had a relatively small sample. So, you know, it, I don't know how relevant that is. Villain goes a bit ahead and a half pots. It's an easy call. I don't think I'm going to be raising this multi way. Turn is the brick, six of diamonds. Villain bets again. So this is the point in the hand where you need to really make decisions. This is why you don't genuinely call these types of hands, especially versus big blind, like these really polarized situations. It's because there's not going to be many scenarios that you're just going to like sort of default, make loads of money. The guy's going to bluff you a lot. The guy's going to have loads of value bets against you. And you're only going to, there's only certain types of board textures that you can really defend really well, depending, you know, and you, I'd rather just, I could just have ace jack here, for example, that beats like king jack and queen jack and so on. Whereas jack 10 is just like, I block nine ten. That's kind of annoying. You know, I, I kind of block... Um, some of the potential bluffs and also it's just it doesn't beat any value really does it and Finland's not supposed to really be three bedding and going crazy with jack nine suited a whole bunch so it's like you see what I'm saying it's more like a naked jack eye connector whereas I could just have a, a, an ace jack suited for example to play instead anyway so I didn't really have that much information I kind of felt like villain was quite aggressive decided to go for a call and then basically just I'm just going to call the river with the very very limited information I have um, the problem is there's just not many there's not many sort of draws or hands that villain really would be expected at 2nl to just kind of go crazy with unless he does actually have some like you know I dare say like some like sort of jack 10 or um sort of, sorry um like some quick some king jack suiters that he might just barrel and blast might have some king queen offs he might do some double and tripling versus river shove like you know I, I kind of feel like to have played this hand better i know this is results orientated i feel like we probably could have just folded pre-flop and just sort of avoided this situation altogether if i did call which i did finding top pair i don't think i could just fold as played but again it's like I could have just potentially just avoided this scenario altogether by just folding pre-flop and then moving on to the next scenario rather than sort of calling, you know, we could call the flop here, I suppose, because we've got all the back doors and a top pair versus one C bet, but versus a dry turn, we probably could have just got away, to be honest, I suppose, versus the versus the population. So that's that one versus aces. I think I against another villain in another stake that's relatively normal or standard, I think against this population it was a bit of a mistake um personally let's have a look what do we have here so we have sorry one second we have king 10 so we open the king 10 off under the gun okie dokie a little bit loose but it's i suppose okay um get a call from the cutoff and we are heads up Flop, oh no, we're multi-way, sorry, because small blind calls. Um, flop top two, that's always good. I would like to see a small bet or check most of the time, multi-way. Okay. To be fair, I suppose you could go like sort of 40% here um, on the flop or check rather than sort of bet small because this is a very dynamic board. But anyway, um, we get a call and a relatively small check raise. It's an easy call, I would assume. We do call and color folds. Brick on the turn, hoping for a relatively small to medium size that we can just continue as a call. 
Villain goes for half pot. It's just an easy call, isn't it? We're, we're, we're beating some hands like Ace X with the Ace of Spades, like you know, like maybe like Ace Jack off with a spade, for example. We're beating like nine ten. We're beating King Queen. We're beating King Jack with or without a spade. You see, like we're just doing okay. We just want to try and improve this as a straight or a set. And we're obviously got a redraw versus a flush, and then we're potentially ahead some of um, the small to medium part of the check raising range for villain. Although, to be fair, he's probably just value betting most of the time. But we're doing okay versus half pot, I suppose. We can just call him decision. If we know villain is extremely deft tight, then you might even consider folding even versus half here. If you assume villain's only got flushes or straights here, for example, or like maybe like a set of tens at the at worst, then this becomes more of a fold, technically. So I don't mind a call here versus an unknown, so we do call, and we're also just slightly deeper, which um, makes a slight difference. But anyway, so this is the part of the hand that is interesting. So, villain goes ahead and check. Now, before I show you what happens and what I do and why, I want you to at home to think about what's going on. So, we raised under the gun. We got called. We got check raised multi way on the flop. We called. They bet the turn. We called. Here we are. Villain was representing a flush on the flop, wasn't he? He was representing a straight. He's representing a set. He's representing a hand similar to ours. He's representing a flush, a straight, a set, etc. Top two, whatnot. A good hand. As played... I, I'm trying to, re I do remember this hand a little bit, not like a massive amount, because I think it was about a month, like maybe five or six weeks ago, actually, this one, this is one of the earlier ones, I believe. I do remember thinking, somewhat anyway, that there was, when with the, if, if this was like the offsuit eight, I just check back, because it's just, we want to get to showdown, there's not really any point in doing anything here. Against this specific river, I felt like if villain had, like, what's, what's the worst hand villain can have that we beat, for example? Like, he can, I suppose he can have 9-10 or king-9. So there is argument even still for just checking this back, which would have been fine. And um, I assume we would probably just do in theory most of the time. I do believe I went crazy here because I think the way I perceived, uh, perceived this player was most of his range was value, which means that, you know, we're doing okay against some of his range. But, like, if he had, like... Say, for example, he's got like 9-10, right? We do technically block that to some extent. So, I mean, what I'm saying is before I talk out my ass is we really should have just checked this back. Because what I do is I actually jam this. I'm going to tell you why I jam this. I'm not saying it's a really good play, by the way, but I know I beat 10-9 and I beat King-9. So I wish I had just checked, personally. I, I That's why I wish I had just checked, in theory, before you see the results, win or lose. Um... But with this spade, if he had a set or a straight, which is most of his range, I lose. And if he has a flush, I also lose. The thing is, it's just like, I'm not calling because I'm only trying to improve on the flop and turn. I think they're just easy calls. But getting here versus river check, and I think again, he checked quite quickly. If he had a flush, I think he will fault. I don't think he's trapping me here. I think he's just going to fault, honestly, because it, you know, I've just basically got a lot of really big flushes here as played. I've got all like the ace kings, the, you know, etc with a spade and so on. That would cool down and jam the river. Um, if he's got a straight, he's going to fold. If he's got a set, he's going to fold. If he's got the same hand as me, he's going to fold. He's going to fold all his flushes. I jammed because I felt that because he bet all the way and snap checked the turn, like didn't even think about it. I felt like his range at this point was no longer... I mean, again, it could still be 10-9 and king-9. But I actually felt like a lot of his value range which is way more combos compared to, on the flop and turn, compared to him having like a hand similar to mine, like a two pair style combo. He's actually got so many value combos on the flop and turn that now will fold this river. So actually I felt in the moment, I kind of had a moment of madness where I kind of felt like I actually think I win this pot about nine to maybe nine and a half, maybe even 10 times out of 10, the way he has played. You know, I. I generally, looking back at this, um, really like this for that explicitive reason. I'm, you know, I'm saying it would have just been better to just check back and keep the hand easy. You know, we don't need to take any crazy spots. But I really felt like his, he was very value orientated to snap check this river from the flop and turn. Getting to this river snap check, that he's just got loads of sets, straights, and flopped small to medium flushes. That will just fold to my river jam. Honestly, I, I really, really did. So that's why I shoved, and that was my reasoning for shoving. That's why I, that's why I felt like this hand was quite interesting. I'm not saying it's a really good play because it, you could just you could technically beat King Nine. You could technically beat 
a very, very small amount of hands still. So you just get to showdown. You don't need to do anything, really. You don't need to do any betting. But that's why I decided to jam this river. If this was an offsuit eight, it's a snap check. But considering it was the eight of spades, that's why I jammed. Anyway, so Villain did unfortunately call, which you know what that means. But he didn't trap to some extent. I suppose he just kind of nit rolled me or just didn't really know the strength of his hand or didn't really know I played. I'm not saying his check here with Jack of Spades is really terrible because it's not. But I'm just saying I think the way Population has played, I, th I think it's just like he knows he's value betting flop and turn. But versus the river, like he's just not really ever going to go for value at any point. And I think he's just kind of mainly checking just in case sort of thing and doesn't mind losing a potentially a little bit of value versus um, some hands. But, you know, to be fair, there's not really many other hands that I would call potentially call the river bet with. So actually this check is pretty good, to be honest. It's actually okay, think, come to think of it. But I think he's probably going to check here with the other way, suits the other way around, I would probably assume as well. He'd probably only bet like the nut flush most of the time. Anyway, so that was that one. That was, uh, was a bit different, a bit interesting. So that's why um, we decided to implode on the eight of spades, unfortunately. Um, couple left. We have the Ace Deuce. I think what we're going to do is I'm going to do the, another 10, 15 minutes. We're going to make this a long video and then I'm going to finish. I was trying to get this done in between sort of 40 and 50 minutes and I think we'll probably go closer to an hour. So I do apologize. But um, these hand histories are the main part of the video that I wanted to sort of go through. So Ace Deuce suited. So we found an open. Uh, I think Ace Deuce suited technically you know, theoretically is is either a mixed or a very low, if not just not really opened under the gun. In these stakes, I feel like I can make a very, very small smidge of profit from it. That's why we do open. We get a call and we're heads up. So the thing that's interesting with this hand is I decided to be funky. Um, we do turn some of our low, low bottom pairs and so on into bluffs um, in, in single raise pots and three bet pots. A lot of uh, some of the time so i just decided to be funky i think is as a as a population thing i think it's better just to go ahead and see that and villain's just going to fold a bunch or we get a bit more information and get to sort of sort of condense his range into what his calling range looks like and we know kind of what we're up against most of the time we decided i decided to check here which is a little bit more of a theory thing i suppose but i would have rather just see that um versus this size again it should really be just cool most of the time so again these hands do have errors in them. Um, but I don't know. I, I just decided to raise this time um, representing a set of deuces. Also just being able to just attain some fold equity. If this guy just bets his whole range of check to, then it's going to fold out king, queen of hearts. It's going to fold out pocket nines, pocket eights, pocket sevens. I'm blocking pocket deuces, um, things like that, right? So, you know, I don't hate it, but it's just C betting makes life easier, doesn't it? Rather than sort of check raising and forcing it. We do go for the check raise. Um, size is pretty decent, I think, here, like sort of almost 4x. You've maybe even gone a tad, a tad bigger or slightly smaller. Either probably would have been fine. Unfortunately, get the call. So our combo doesn't, I mean, it blocks pocket deuces. That's the main thing. But we don't block like. I mean, we didn't get three bet, did we? So villain shouldn't really have like tens or jacks, mo really, I would assume. Um, I would think most recreationals tend to three bet those rather than just call them hijack UTG. So this guy's either got like a hand like pocket fours or he's got a 10. That's really what he's got, all the case deuces, but it's somewhat somewhat difficult to have that. So he's got a lot of 10x. Um, so I think, <laughs> I, I, I already know what happens in this one, but I think I would have preferred to have given up at this point because what I did was I decided to follow through um, with a rough, like roughly half pot size on the turn to then jam river like just gonna that's what i'm gonna do i think against a perceived recreational player i wish i had just given up on this turn really because he's just got a lot of condensed hands especially versus a check raise um from from aggressor on a board this dry like he doesn't really have eights anymore to some extent he's mainly got like 10x that's mostly what his range is or better so we don't block any 10x we only block i suppose we block ace 10 off but I suppose that is somewhat relevant against maybe this type of player, but really he's just got a good hand and we probably should have given up. I decided to go for the turn bet into River Jam. I suppose, you know, you I, you could argue that I can represent and also block Ace-5 of clubs, for example. Uh, you know, again, at micro stakes, it becomes a little bit less relevant to some extent um, because hijack shouldn't really be calling anyway. They should really be three betting or folding most of the time. I decided to go for it, just saying, look, I've got a set of deuces. That's the way I'd play a set of deuces. I want to have some bluffs. I don't need to tell Villain a story like that. I basically should just be C-betting flop 
and betting turn. That's that's really what I should be doing or checking turn um, or check calling flop. That's what I should really be doing um, as played. We do get called and uh, I mean, Kings is a little bit overkill, but it's the same type of thing just a bit um, elevated. He should really have like ace 10, king 10, queen 10, jack 10, etc., etc. That's not really going to fold or supposed to fold really to some extent, especially against recreational. So I wish I had not done this. I like my check rose in the flop, but I would have preferred to have just see bet. And I think I probably should have just given up on the turn. Considering how dry this board is, does he really bet call king, queen of hearts? You know, does he really sort, you know, on the flop? It, not really. He's just got like nines at worst or a 10 or better. So I kind of wish I'd just given up or just see bet generically. So that's that one. Um, let's have a look. I do believe we do have value next, hopefully, that we didn't play like absolute toilet. So we have aces. Okay, let's have a look at this one. Make sure I can see it. There we go. Aces on the big blind. So we get a uh, hijack open, a button three bet. And I don't want to be calling this. What do you think we're going to be doing? We're going to be four betting. I could have potentially made this a little bit bigger, but I went closer to theory and just had a very, very small four bet size. We're always going to be very value heavy here. Villains know we're going to be very value orientated here, but I don't think they're really going to be folding um, to this size. Like the three bet is not going to be folding to this size. So it's, it's, it is what it is. We're just kind of hoping villains got something good enough or wants to start sort of fishing about, wailing about with something that shouldn't call, but will. Um, that's why four betting kind of sucks in a way because it's like we just get value from hands that we're supposed to but because of micro stakes people people don't just uh, just call crazy hands most of the time they actually just fold loads unless they have like monsters so but I mean we're always four betting for value aren't we but uh, we do get a fold and then we get a call from the three better so this is what we were kind of looking for because we wanted to build this pot and put a shitload of money in with aces really don't we stack a lot of um, worse hands the reason I I mean, aces are aces. The reason I put this into um, some of the more interesting hands is because I just, just, I don't think I had any information on this villain, right? I think this is just a genuine villain. Because the board's so fucking dry, and because I've got the ace of diamonds, it's like, I just block, like, ace jack of diamonds, ace queen of diamonds, ace king of diamonds, whatnot, you know, and then he's going to have some king x of diamonds, or maybe jack ten of diamonds, etc. but whatever. But I limit so many hands that you, the population likely three bets and then calls uh, a cold four with so like ace queen of suit you know of diamonds etc more so than like you know maybe king 10 of diamonds or something so this ace of diamonds is really relevant is what i'm saying so i decided not to bet this i felt like if this villain's got a value range so he's got like i don't know like eights nines tens jacks queens um and then he's got his flush draws and then maybe some just bluffs you know might just have like king queen of spades or maybe just goes crazy with jack ten of diamonds versus check i don't know i felt like i'd make more money by going for a check and then depending on size either jam or call cool. so we get a check back on the flop which is unfortunate but we're basically assuming that this guy's mostly just got like potentially just like king queen suited like ace jack of clubs things like that. Oh, or diamonds sorry because we blocked the clubs something like that right so you know it is what it is on the three of hearts it's just a brick nothing changes it's the same story as on the flop so we went for a check again i felt like i don't get that much money by betting this i'm not too scared of flushes because i feel like villain would have bet the flop and if he does have a flush draw he's most likely probably going to bet the turn i would assume you know maybe we get punished for it but you will find out in a second he does go ahead and go with the bet and um, I think I just called. Did I call? Yes, I went for a call this time. I like my call. I think going for a check raise here doesn't make too much sense. I don't think he's got tons of value that will stack off as played. And I'm not really scared of any river card, technically. So, yeah, I like the call. Deuce doesn't really change anything unless he just has, like, ace two suited. But, you know, again, it's like, does he really three bet that on the button and four, call the four bet? Probably not. So, um, check the river. Got a bet from Villain. Obvious check jam for value, and we actually win. So villain actually folded. So I'm assuming he would probably have checked back ace high, maybe bluffed it, depending on the player time. But whatever. I've, this just looks like a bluff, doesn't it? Really. So I think we netted an extra sort of 90 cents there, sort of 40 bigs, 45 big blinds from allowing villain to bluff in this scenario. So I was quite happy with it. I think that was quite a well played hand. So um, that was a bit more of an interesting one there. Last cut three hands and then we are done is what have we got here? Ace for suited. Get okay, UTG open. Decide to three bet this one. Okie dokie. Get the call. So this was a bit of an aggressively played hand. 
Big Blind versus UTG is one of the is very polarized. So we're basically like UTG will defend with some with a lot of very strong calls versus this big blind call. They will even have some hands like aces, I believe. They'll have some kings. They will have like queens and jacks and so on. And they will have good hands as along with us. I would think that they do some calling with ace king, but mostly re-raising. But um they will definitely have good pairs and so on in this one. On the 336, um, I just really want to be going sort of mostly big or check, I believe. I think um, um, micro stakes, so I bet big here because also I'm just bluffing, aren't I? Villain's not really going to have 3 4 suited or really. Uh, he could have ace 3 suited. So this is somewhat relevant having this blocker as the ace of diamonds. But blocking all his ace x that are going to fold the flop or turn is kind of bad. But whatever. It is what it is. I just had to go polar. I, I kind of wish I just stuck to my normal situation and normal strategy at micros, which is just to bet small because I would rather just bet and barrel and just do this like one, two and sometimes three stage knockout combo that just works most of the time rather than sort of going really big and polarizing and Whoa, hope you fold this time and then I'm going to have loads of crappy weak churn checks. We do go big and get a call, which is really bad. So we're going to need help or we're going to need scary cards. We do get the queen of hearts, which is a nice card. So villain does have queens. Technically, he should have ace queen of like spades and ace queen of clubs, but we bet really big on the flop. So I don't think villains got as played that many like king queen ace queen suited in this population. I don't think they're ever going to call those most of the time. I think he's very pair orientated. So apart from him having queens, which is obviously now limited by the queen queen on the turn, I believe we can attack like jacks and tens and nines and eights and so on, and then attack them on the river as well by jamming. So. Villain's going to continue here with most of his like jacks and tens and then fold river. We're hoping. I don't think population finds enough calls. Um, they could they, they tend, on the river is what I'm saying. He's going to have flush draws. He's going to have some decent pairs. Very rarely he might have like ace queen of clubs, but against a huge size, I think he folds those. So I think we should be betting turn quite often. Again, sort of around sort of half sixty percent might be quite good, just because of the SPR. Maybe even sort of around forty percent, but. Um, what did I go here? I went for about third. And this is to sort of, this is to fold out his like ace king of spades. This is to fold out his like um, king queen of clubs that may or may not have floated. This is to attack like, you know, sort of five, six suited or sevens or eights or nines that called one on the flop. And then like his tens, his jacks, his turn heart draws, etc., are going to continue. Um, six is a fantastic card because villains shouldn't really open that many hands with six X. Call a three bet, call the flop a big size on the flop and then call the turn so i actually think the only combos of hands are things like threes and sixes which are now limited even further by this river six so what i want to do now really is just shove against like nines or tens or jacks and then obviously like just jam and fold out his like ace x of hearts that may have got here for example if they if they do that is but it's somewhat less likely um so we do go for the shove and uh we get it through which is always nice I would probably assume villains got more hands like jacks and tens and nines as played. So that's what I would assume most villains are going to get here as played. So I was pretty happy with that. So that was a pretty decent one. Last two hands we have, what have we got here? King five suited. Let's make that a little bit bigger so you can actually see. Um, so what happens here? Button opens. We three bet the big blind with the king five suited. I like it. Get the call. So pretty decent board for the big blind. Technically, we're supposed to have more hands like pocket tens. We're going to have more hands like ace king and ace queen and, um, and so on. Technically, button's supposed to be doing a decent amount of um, potentially shoving and so on and also raising with ace king and ace queen and so on. But that's more theory based. Exploitatively, I suppose the way that the pool plays, he will probably have more tens and more ace king slash ace queen than he's probably supposed to. But you know, it is what it is. We block ace king, which they can sometimes call with exploitatively. Plus, we just have bot kind of bottom row. We just have king five. I think because the, the the board's quite good for us, we should mostly be betting. We go for a small size, and I'm going to be doing loads of baroning and blasting. That's basically what I'm going to be doing. If this guy's got ace queen, ace jack, you know, then we're going to be in some trouble. There will be some turn cards we will also potentially have to give up on. But um, we get the call for a small size. Nice brick on the turn. I just think, like, I'm just going to go for it in a lot of these scenarios. Like, I feel like villain's going to have to have, like, pocket tens, ace ten, ace queen to cool down. And some of villains do tend to even fold hands like ace queen, ace jack by the river. So I'm going to go for it. Um, go for a relatively sort of marginal size to then jam river. 
get the call, rivers the brick. Now we're just going to jam and hope he folds a hand like... Um, it, it's a tough one because I suppose like he shouldn't really have Jack-8 suited. He shouldn't really have 10-9 suited. He could technically have Ace-9 that's improved. But apart from that, it's like we're folding out flush draws and straight draws. I'm really targeting villains like weaker Ace-X. Like, honestly, like um, Ace-Jack, Ace-8 suited... Um, potentially some like 7x of clubs like i'm not saying this is a great jam i'm just going for a jam because i've got like nut value I i've got most of the nutted hands here i block ace king i'm just hoping this guy's got like a, a kind of marginal made ace that might fold um and i don't think i like like going quite small because he might sometimes have a hand like king ten of hearts that called the turn and would fold river to shove so i'm not saying i love this line because we're just kind of the rep like villain will have a decent amount of folds um, with straight draws, flush draws, and combos, etc. But we are kind of heavily over bluffing here, is what I'm relying on. And I'm not going to say I felt like I have information because I don't. I just went with a very, very aggressive line because I know it works more than it should do. That's why I went for the um, very aggressive line. We do get the folds. Um, I'm not saying this was an extremely well played hand. Just because it works, results orientated doesn't isn't enough for me. I think. I probably would have bet the flop. I think I probably would have bet the flop pure because we have such a good range. I think we just have better hands and better bluffs to attack turn with. So technically, we probably should have just folded, um, check folded turn. Because I did go with an over bluff and we got a brick river, I don't hate this river jam. But um, I think as played, I think this was a little bit too aggressive, personally. So that's something to um, think about. But we can get away with it a lot at micro stakes, but I'm. I think I probably would have given up on that one on the turn, personally. Or maybe maybe just bet, um, range bet the flop and then given up on the turn. So, final hand then. We have... Um, it'd be better if I show you. There we go. King, 10 of spears. Is this our last hand? And then we're done. And that will get us nicely to an hour. So, let's have a look. We get the hijack open. Button call. Small blind call. And here it goes. Okay, let's get to the flop then. So, we flop second nut flush draw with an over. Backdoor straight draw. Okie dokie. A couple of backdoor straight draws even. I decide to check. Okay. Um, aggressive checks. And the button goes half pot. So, you could go either way. I suppose we could check raise. We've got a bit pretty decent hand here. We could check raise and go with it. We... Um, I mean, again, it's like I feel like it's a little bit too volatile the way these populations play. Most of the time, villains are a little bit more honest multi-way. So I, what do we do here? We did call. I think I like the call more than raise. And then the times I would raise, I'd prefer to raise like a nut flush combo just so I know I can um, stack worse flush draws rather than potentially stacking off against value range and better flush draws than mine. So we do turn the second nuts, which is obviously very nice on the turn. I think I would have liked a small lead here or check. Uh, we do go for the check. And unfortunately, it checks all the way through. So with the River 5, I don't know if I would say this is a total brick because 7-9... Oh, sorry, any 7 technically is a straight. 7-9 uh, on the flop was um, the open ender, but I suppose there's those. I would prefer... I, I, I Did we bet? Let's have a look first. No, we checked. I think as played, I actually would have preferred to have bet this. I don't really actually technically know why I checked. I think I'm just praying that multi-way someone's made a 7 and I can go for a check raise. I think, if I remember rightly. So villain does bet, and villain bet's quite big here. So this guy comes out of nowhere. So this is either a bluff or a very or a very good value hand, like a trap flush. Um, or he's rivet a straight or something. And then button calls, and I'm like, hang on. <laughs> What's going on here? With the second nuts here, we, it's just an easy shove. I, there's nothing else to say. Like, we just, if, if someone's got us beat, then we're just going to stack off, you know? I, it's weird, isn't it? Because if you, if you th technically think about it, this is the aggressor. You would think he would better flush draw most of the time on the flop, which he doesn't. And then he just check calls. So it's like, I didn't put this guy on like the nut flush draw, for example. I'd put this guy on like a, a queen or like pocket, you know, like sevens to make a river a straight or like a small or medium flush draw that he didn't want to bet multi-way more often than like, you know, that. But, you know, it is what it is. I'm still going to get stacked with the second, second nuts. There's nothing really else to say. Um... So versus this, I didn't want to call. I feel like we're leaking money by not going all in against um, two and L players. We're just going to go all in. 100 bigs effective. Stick it in. Uh, villain snap calls, which is mostly bad. And we are up against bonk, nut flush. It is what it is. Um, nothing really, I suppose, you can do about that one. Could I just call the river? We're being results orientated. No, I think we still just stick this in. Um, 
interesting that this guy doesn't bet the most i'm not saying it's bad but it's just you know most i don't really see many people at micro stakes checking plus draws of any kind um so it's interesting and the other villain rivered a straight poor bastard he had the nut, nut straight and thought he had um so we've had probably us both crushed but uh there you go so that's the final hand so please like please comment please let me know what you think in the um in the in the comment section down below i'll see if i can find some um links for some of the previous strategy videos for micro stakes and put them in the description for you like i said at the beginning and um just finally there's been a lot of uh, there's so many fucking trolls man like there's trolls all over the place like there's really good feedback and there's also a bunch of trolls and like super death um backseat you know I don't mind people crit critiquing my videos. Like, please do put your your thoughts and, um, you know, I ask every video literally for you to comment on the videos. I'm not saying I only want good, um, adv um, good advice or good feedback. But, like, if you're going to critique spots, like, I prefer you to just say it in a slightly nicer way. Like, oh, have you tried this? Or do you think about this? Rather than saying, that's really shit. Or, like, that's really bad. Or you're awful, you know? Try and think about things. You know, try and be a little bit more friendly, you know? And to all the guys who've been, you know, liking and supporting the channel as always like thank you so much uh, i really really appreciate it and the link is below for the discord as well and also the twitch stream so i'll see you in the next one goodbye